So why do we care about toxic stress? It literally changes the brain's architecture. You see these two pictures. The picture on the left is a neuron of a typically developing three-year-old child. All sorts of chaos and confusion. It's a wonderful map of spaghetti. That's exactly what we want to see in a normally developing brain. Lots of overlapping connections going on inside that neuron. The picture on the right is of a neuron of a three-year-old child who's experienced significant trauma. You see fewer connections. And what you don't see as well from that picture, but that is also happening, is the connections that are there in that brain are stronger. Now, how many of you have ever been the parent of a teenager? All right, so you know, you, my, my kids are 28 and 25, so we've lived through this in my household. But you put your perfectly intelligent child to bed one night, and the next morning they wake up, and they have forgotten half the things you thought they knew, right? And at first you think they're just messing with you, and you think, maybe a little cynically, that they're doing it on purpose. But what happens in a teenager's brain is called pruning. And that's a very normal thing to have happen in an adolescent brain. Just like with a rose bush, when you prune away all of the extra growth, what remains and continues to grow is stronger and thicker and more effective. In an adolescent brain, pruning is exactly what we want to see because we want to start to make the permanent connections in that brain strong and resilient. In a three-year-old's brain, you do not want to have connections be strong um, and communicating to the body uh, what's going on in that three-year-old's life, especially when what's going on in that three-year-old's life is the message that the world is a dangerous place that should be feared. So what happens is the brain's structure is changing as a result of this exposure to toxic stress. So what we have is that, um, so all of y'all have been scared at one point in your lives, right? And you know what that feels right, like. You, you have either, and you have no control, you are predestined uh, to either be somebody who goes into fight mode, so when you're scared, you're gonna just, you are automatically going to defend yourself. Um, or you are, you know, pre-programmed to go into flight mode. When you're scared, you're going to run away and hide and try to protect yourself. Well, these kids' bodies and brains are being triggered into fight or flight mode over and over and over again. And what happens is that they start to expect to be afraid. And so even under situations where a person who hadn't experienced significant toxic stress would find neutral, they're going to overreact. So the example I like to use is um, there's a, a little girl who's sitting at her desk in kindergarten, and she um, has a, a high A score, and she's sitting there, and she's being quiet, and one of her little friends walks by and looks at her, and her friend is thinking, oh, what a pretty dress. But because she's studying her, for more than the normal amount of time, this little girl feels that that's a threat. And so she's going to react however it is that she's pre-programmed, right? And let's say she's pre-programmed to go into fight mode. So she perceives a threat from a very mundane, neutral situation, but what she's going to do as a kindergartner is 
maybe yell, maybe stand up and push the desk towards the person who's threatening her, maybe even push the child who's threatening her. And if you're a teacher in a classroom where this is happening, what you see is this little girl walked by, somebody sitting at a desk, did not talk, did not touch, did not interact with the child who's sitting down, and yet this child reacted completely inappropriately and lost it. Then what do we do, right? As teachers, what do we do? We ha there has to be consequences. There has to be some sort of negative thing that happens to that child so that she understands that it's not appropriate to push her friend or her classmates. And so our discipline system in the United States is based on fear. So we've got a little girl who's afraid of life in general, who acts inappropriately, and who is disciplined by being scared. So we're just exacerbating the situation. So on the other hand, we've got the child who's pre-programmed for flight mode. And those are the ones that I actually worry about more because they aren't going to get any attention from anybody ever. What they want more than anything in the world is to be able to disappear. They don't want anybody to be able to see them because if they can't be seen, they can't be hurt. And those are the kids who are perfect angels in the classroom, right? They never talk, they never disrupt. They, they're not the ones who are gonna be pushing or hitting or anything, but they also don't get the attention that they need for you to start to understand that they are also experiencing toxic stress. So what we see in these kids' brains is that not just the, this, this neural network that is not getting as much attention as it should, but the areas of the brain that are not getting the attention that it should get. So think about this, right? You're a child, your whole world is based on being afraid. What part of your brain do you think you're gonna be developing? The brain that thinks about how can I stay safe, right? That's the opposite part of the brain that thinks about cause and effect, long-term planning, executive function. So the prefrontal cortex of the brain is not getting the development or the growth that it needs in order for it to be ready to propel that child into adulthood and to be able to pay attention, sit still, think about cause and effect, if this, then that. That part of the brain isn't getting any attention because it makes sense, right? If, if you're worried about living through the day, you're not gonna be able to think about tomorrow. And that's what's going on in these kids' brains. So what we see in the kids is they have weaker impulse control because they haven't developed that part of their brain. They have shorter attention spans, um, and they are less able to think through those logical if this, then that concepts or reasoning in the brain. And then the brain talks to the body, right? So when we've got a brain that's telling a child that the world is a dangerous place that should be feared, it's telling the body too, because when you're in fight or flight mode, there are changes that happen in your body. I mean, we've all been scared, right? You know what it feels like. Your heart races, you get that flush of adrenaline, you get more blood to certain parts of your body so that you can escape the danger which means that less blood is going to other parts of your body that aren't involved in the immediate danger. 
And so what happens is the brain is telling the body that it needs to be constantly on alert and ready to either fight or flee. And that creates a high level of stress hormones. And when a three-year-old's body has a high level of stress hormones, that's a really bad thing. Now, when a 50-year-old's body has a high level of stress hormones, that's just life, right? We know what that feels like. That's just part of getting old. But we know that increased stress hormones leads to chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation leads to chronic disease. The other thing that happens, and this is what I call the double whammy, the other thing that happens in these kids' bodies is their brains are telling their bodies that they need to be afraid. They, they are developing around a perpetual feeling of fear and anxiety. Then they turn into teenagers, and we thought their brains were a mess before, and they're going through the pruning process, and some of the things that we thought they knew, they no longer know. And what they look for is anything that they can do to stop feeling afraid. And so these teenagers are at much higher risk for drug addiction, sex addiction, video game addiction, anything that they can do to escape this feeling of fear and anxiety. And usually those things that they can do are addictive. And so now we're also rewiring the brain around addiction. So what we know is that there is a dose-response relationship between the number of adverse childhood experiences and your risk of developing chronic disease, your risk of uh, developing addictive behaviors, and um, your risk of having poor life potential. So the higher your ACE score, the more likely you are to have a heart attack, for example, the more likely you are to be a smoker or an alcoholic, the more likely you are to um, drop out of high school, not go to college, not do well when you have a job. So these kids' experiences in their childhood is affecting the rest of their lives. And those of us who worked with kids, this is not exactly an aha moment, right? But it blows my mind how many people who don't work with kids seem to think that kids' brains are in some sort of box and then they become adults and they like turn that box in for a different box and somehow everything's okay. And so this concept has been mind blowing for a lot of people who don't work with kids. This chart has been mind blowing for me. So it's a little geeky, I apologize for that, but um, I'm, I'm, it's, it, it's gonna make sense in a second. So what this is, is the top 10 leading causes of death for people in the United States. For people here in San Antonio, it's basically the same no, list of things. They're in a slightly different order, but this is what's killing people here in the United States. Now, the number one thing that's killing people in the United States is heart disease. That's not a surprise, right? We, we know that. Um, Anybody just shout out for me what you think is the risk of developing heart disease if you have high cholesterol? Because right, we all know that if you have high cholesterol, you're at high risk for heart disease. What do you think your percent increased risk is if you have high cholesterol that you'll develop heart disease? 30, 40, 20? So it's 39%. So whoever said 40, good job. 39% increased risk of developing heart disease if you have high cholesterol. And we go to the doctor and we get a cholesterol test every year, 
right? And we get that talking to if our cholesterol is a little bit high or if it's gone up or if we're not doing our diet and exercise like we're supposed to. What this chart tells you is that if, you're, if your A score is four, sorry, this is another one of those holy cow moments. If your A score is four, you have a 200% increased risk for heart disease. Have any of you ever gone to the doctor and had the doctor ask you about trauma in childhood in relationship to your heart health? Never. I, one time, I've given this talk like 50 times. One time I had a woman raise her hand. I'm like, I wanna know who your doctor is because I wanna go there. Almost a 200% increased risk for cancer. Almost a 400% increased risk for chronic respiratory diseases. Here's the thing that freaks a lot of people out, Alzheimer's. 400% increased risk for developing Alzheimer's if your A score is four. And I'm not saying four or more. I'm saying four. It's higher if it's the or more. But if you think about that Alzheimer's risk, it makes sense, right? We just looked at what, what uh, toxic stress does to kids' brains. It rewires them, it develops them differently. The same areas of the brain that are affected in Alzheimer's are the areas of the brain that are affected during toxic stress. They got less attention in childhood, they're gonna be the first to start to diminish as we get older. The other thing that I wanna talk about is suicide. Look at that odds for suicide. It is so rare to have an odds ratio of 12 for anything in research. But I don't very often hear people talk about suicide prevention through the lens of childhood trauma. And I think we need to start thinking about how we can help people who are at risk of suicide understand the trauma that they experienced in childhood and heal from that as a way of addressing that suicide risk. So here's what we know. Without intervention, there can be a 20-year difference in life expectancy for people with low A scores and people with high A scores. Now I have another talk that I like to give throughout San Antonio that has a picture of the entire city of San Antonio. It's a map. And on this map, I have life expectancy by zip code. Y'all know where I'm going, don't you? The zip codes with the lowest life expectancy are the zip codes with the lowest education and the lowest income, and emerging research is showing us the zip codes with the highest ACE scores. So if, if we're about helping people live long, healthy lives, we've got to address ACEs.